welcome to everyone from around the world, um, morning and evening, depending where you are. And a special welcome to Bertrand Picard of Solar Impulse Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Bertrand, um, you're going to talk to us today about why the climate crisis is the biggest business opportunity in history. Uh, innovation has been in your family for generations. And we're keen to hear today how any business leader can capture that pioneering spirit and apply these leadership lessons against a more profitable, profitable business that also helps solve one of our biggest crises we face right now, the threat to our environment. Uh, in 2016, you became the first person to circumnavigate the world in a solar powered airplane, something many people would have believed impossible. Yes, yet it's exactly this attitude of attempting the impossible that breeds new ideas and moves the world forward. And as part of our discussion today, we'd like to understand how a business leader can harness the same mindset uh, to take their companies to greater heights. You've also embarked on a very ambitious project with the Solar Impulse Foundation to find 1,000 profitable business solutions to protect the environment. And I believe you're almost now at that goal. So I'm sure you're not short on any ideas on how business can include a profitable climate solution in their business strategy. So I would like to start by asking you why you think the current climate crisis will become the biggest business opportunity in history and how we can all become involved. Thank you, Grant, and uh, thank you to, to all of you. Uh, I think my biggest leadership experience came from flying a balloon nonstop around the world. I was pushed by the wind. And the only way to change the direction was to change the altitude. And if you drop some ballast, you drop some weight, you climb, change altitude, and you find other currents that have other directions. And this, for me, was so important because I understood that if you want to be a leader in life, you need to have this ability to get rid of the certitudes, the habits, the beliefs, the common assumptions, the paradigms, that the, the dogmas that keep you prisoner of the wrong altitude. In order to change your altitude, it means change your way of thinking and try to explore all the different ways of thinking, all the different ways of behaving, and to check where they will lead to. And sometimes it's a wrong direction, so you don't stay at this altitude, at this way of thinking. Sometimes it brings you to a better direction, so, so you keep it. So when we speak about the climate crisis, what do we see? What was the altitude at which the world was going in the last 50 years? You had a massive increase in production of waste, of inefficiency, leading to the ecological disaster we are in today. And what was the reaction of the environmental activists? It was also a wrong altitude saying, if we want to protect the environment, it's going to be very expensive. We need to put a lot of subsidies. We need to make a lot of sacrifice, reduce consumption, reduce comfort, reduce growth, reduce mobility. With what result? Nobody wanted to follow. Nobody wanted to have less. Everybody wanted to have better. So. There is now another altitude, another way of thinking, which is maybe exactly the opposite. Can the protection of the environment, the fight against climate change, be profitable? Can it create jobs? Can it make money? Can it increase the enthusiasm of the population? And at the same time, be, be uh, environmental friendly, protect the environment. So this question was very, very present in my mind when I was flying with solar impulse, mainly above the oceans. You, you imagine an experimental airplane that has the wingspan of a jumbo jet and the weight of a small car because it's built out of carbon fiber. It can fly almost perpetually because you gain the energy from the sun during the day. You run the electric motors, you charge the batteries. So you can fly at night on solar power, reach the next sunrise, and continue like this day and night after day and night. And there was a moment where I was looking my big propellers turning next to the cockpit, 
there was no noise, there was no pollution, there was no fuel, not a single drop of fuel. And I was thinking, wow, it's, it's a dream. I, I, it's not possible. I, I'm, in a, I'm in a science fiction movie. You know, it's, the, it's the, 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 the future. I'm propelled in the future already. And I had to pinch myself to realize that it was true because it was not the future. It was what the technologies of today allowed me to do today. And then I had like a revelation, re revelation. If I'm not in the future, it means that it's the rest of the world that is in the past. The rest of the world is completely in the past with combustion engines, which are 27% efficient when my electric motors were 97% efficient in buildings that are so badly insulated that you lose the heating or the cooling system outside. You have in this world inefficient lighting systems, heating systems. You burn and pollute the world with fossil energies that create electricity, heat, or movement. You have all the industrial processes. Well, are we proud of that? It's amazing. So we wave our latest smartphone thinking, uh, I'm really modern, but everything else we use, everything else was invented 100 years ago at the beginning of the oil era. So when we speak about destruction of the environment, it is not primarily the standard of life that we have that, dest that destroys the environment. It's the completely inefficient way that we use technologies that are outdated and that we should change. So if we speak of the situation today, we can either continue with the old technologies we have, we will waste the resources, waste energy, waste food, waste, uh, we even waste waste because we don't understand that it's a resource for a new industry. So we can continue this way. We will destroy our vital uh, environment and we will be less and less profitable with more and more problems and crisis. Or we can replace these old technologies, these old infrastructures by modern ones. So the question is, are there enough modern technologies that protect the environment, that can replace the old technologies, and at the same time create jobs, make money, and protect the environment? And the answer is yes. Five years ago, I would not have been so optimistic because when I initiated the challenge of finding 1,000 solutions that can protect the environment in a financially profitable way, people told me it was impossible. Well, they told me the same for the balloon flight. They told me the same for solar impulse, so I'm used to it. And, but we got some solutions one after the other. And then people told us you cannot have more than 300 because 300 is the number of problems there are in the world. <laughs> well, the number of problems they have identified. Today, as you were saying, Rand, we have 950 of these solutions in the field of water, energy, construction, mobility, industry, agriculture. And they come from startups, they come from big companies, and all together, they would allow to solve most of the problems we have today. So you see, there is not one miracle solution, but there are so many solutions that it becomes a miracle you have so many solutions available. And these solutions can be used everywhere by all the people who are leaders and pioneers, all the people who want to make more money, who want to create more jobs. And uh, I think it's the best way to speak the language of the people we want to, to motivate. Because who has the power today? The people who are leading countries and their worries about employment, or the big business leaders, and their worries about profit. So if you talk to them about only protecting the environment, they will never listen. But if you go to them and say, look, there are a thousand solutions, at least today, but there will be much more in the future, solutions that increase the, the profit, that create more jobs. You have everybody that starts to listen to you. So now the next step is to make everybody aware that these solutions exist, to motivate people to use them, 
to prove that it is profitable, to have business cases, to have examples, to have demonstration, to have success stories. But of course, we need leaders who will take this over in their company, in their country. I was saying with Grant when we're preparing this uh, discussion that we need leaders also in the governments. We need heads of state who are leaders. We need business people who are leaders, not only explorers in the field of adventure, space, uh, conquest, uh, underwater, uh, uh, science, technology. No, we need leaders everywhere. And this is why this initiative of real leaders uh, is so close to my heart. And that's why I'm very happy to participate. So, Grant, I'm sure you have other questions, and I'm very happy to Yes, thank you so much for that, that insight. Um, it, sounds, it sounds as if leader, business leaders need to put themselves into uncomfortable situations to create a breakthrough of some kind. So how would a business leader today with an existing business start? Where would they start? Um, they've got a history of a company or a business or a service that's been going in a certain direction for many years. How do they change course without starting from the beginning again? And is disruption an important part of that process? Disruption is very, very important. And I think that you have to remember that it was never the people selling the candles who invented the light bulb. <laughs> Even in the car industry, when you see the first successful electric car, it did not come from the car industry. It came from a billionaire of the world of Internet who had no idea how to make a car. So he took what he knew, the computer screen, and he built the Tesla around it. And it was so revolutionary that now all the car manufacturers are running behind to desperately have a part of the market share. So we see how dangerous it is to always do more of the same. The straight line in life is very dangerous. Because, of course, in the beginning, we avoid the doubts, we avoid the question marks, we avoid the unknown, we go straight ahead. But once we crash in an obstacle, then we start to think, why is life so bad with me? Instead of asking, why am I not ready for life? So how do we get ready for life? By learning to think exactly the opposite from what we have learned. Exactly the opposite from what we have learned. And then we see what happens. It's not always better, of course. It would be stupid to say that the opposite of what we have learned is always better. No, but what I mean is that what we have learned is one straight line. And if we imagine the opposite in the middle, in between these two extremes, you will have thousands of other options, other opportunities, other ways to think, other ways to decide, other ways to answer. So instead of looking at the future in one dimension, in one direction, we have to see the future in 3D, you know, like in a balloon. Once you monitor the atmosphere, you know exactly for which altitude you have which direction. And at the end, you have a reliable and predictable vision of the future. And you can bring the balloon back to the altitude where the direction goes where you want. So in a company... As long as you stay with the paradigms, with the habits, with the beliefs on the inertia of the past, you are in danger. It does not mean you always have to change everything, but you have to check all the time what are the different options, including completely irrational decisions that you have to include in your way of thinking. Because with this completely open new way of thinking, you will not miss any opportunity. You know, when we are focused on what we know, we miss everything else. If we put what we know in our pocket and we observe everything else, then we can find something completely new and we can do much better. And this is what we see in the decision-making of some big oil companies. Interesting to see that you have the one who are desperately fighting to keep what they have and make the system go as long as they can, with the risk of becoming a stranded asset, stranded asset for the investors. Who is going to invest in oil companies who keep on producing oil when you know that the reserves will not be used because the renewable energies are becoming cheaper? So it's, it's dangerous, it's irrational, it's bad leadership to continue on the old track. And you have uh, 
some oil companies who start some diversification. You have Schlumberger, specialized in oil exploration. They start to drill for geothermia in the cities in order to install heat pumps for all the buildings. If you do that, you will save three quarters of the energy you need to heat a building. And it's an oil company who is doing it. You have Total in France. Total is now changing, shifting to an energy company and not an oil company, shifting to an energy company with hydrogen, with natural gas, with electricity production. And this is why they will survive when others will die. So you see, each time we have to take a decision, let's see everything else that what we have already done and tried. And this makes a real leader. Otherwise, it's just a manager of day-to-day -day business, and it's not enough to be successful. So Bertrand, to the business leaders who are listening now, would you recommend that they come up with one great idea that they're going to follow or diversify their risk, if you want to call it that, and try lots of different innovations and just test the waters in different areas and see which one works to adopt as part of their business strategy? Yeah, for example, for example, they, they, they can do that. It, of course, it depends what they do. Uh, if you are in a very, very polluting business, you, you should understand that you are at risk. So you have to see where you can diversify or which other technologies you can use. The, the cement industry is, is interesting in that sense. Uh, cement and concrete after water is the most common product that we are using in the world. And there is a company called Cinelion, Cinelion uh, that has received the label of the Solar Impulse Foundation. They recover the CO2 from the factory. They combine it with hydrogen that is coming from hydrolysis of water thanks to solar energy. And when you put carbon and hydrogen together, you reproduce a hydrocarbon chain, which, which is a fuel, and that you can burn to continue producing cement in a carbon-neutral way. So we can do much more things if we open ourselves to new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, and, and many using the, the technologies of today rather than using the technologies of the past. And Bertrand, innovation, as I mentioned earlier, goes back in your family to, I think it was your grandfather in the 1800s. And I'm fascinated to know what kind of a, a real leader mindset people need to develop. It's obviously something that's been carried through the generations. What would you attribute that to? And how should a real leader think around innovation? I think a real leader should have curiosity. Curiosity for everything he doesn't know. Instead of being happy with what he knows, he should try to look at everything he doesn't know. And I learned a lot from my grandfather, who was the first man in the stratosphere. He's actually the first man who saw the curvature of the earth with his own eyes. And why that? Because he wanted to go and study the cosmic rays above the atmosphere. And he wanted also to prove that the airplanes could fly above the bad weather. So he invented a pressurized cabin in order to fly higher and show that if you put this in an airplane, you need less gasoline because the air is thinner. So exploration, protection of the environment, curiosity, science, technology, all, all that was what I was born with uh, from my grandfather, from my father who made the deepest dive ever uh, touching the ground of the Marina Trench in 1960, 11 kilometers down and finding traces of life there in a period of time where the governments wanted to drop their radioactive and toxic waste in the deepest oceanic trenches. So since this discovery, all the governments banned the dumping of toxic waste in the oceans. So my experience, the, the models I had were scientific exploration in order to protect the quality of life of people and protect the environment. And uh, if you ask me where this comes from, it comes from there. And it comes also from the fact that explorers are not satisfied with what they see, with what they have. They want more. They want better. They want different. So the they explorers, they, they break the status quo. They want to break the, the certitudes and see what there is behind. So I believe that good leaders, real leaders, should be explorers. 
This is really the, the state of mind in which they have to be. Exploration, try to see beyond the obvious and understand that the impossible is not in the reality. The impossible is in the mindset of the people who believe that the future will be an extrapolation of the past, which is wrong. The future is disruptive. So we need to learn how to be disruptive if we want to cope with the future. Right. right. So what you're saying is we shall become adventurers and pioneers. And what I particularly enjoy is the fact that a lot of, well, when I speak to people, they seem to be motivated only when they see something with their own eyes. Um, would you agree that business leaders need to get out more? Um, obviously, once the lockdown's over and this pandemic has moved on, um, do you think travel and staying curious and interacting with different ideas is a good thing to try and generate new ideas for your business venture? Completely, completely. Um, you need to be in contact with people who think differently. Even your advisors, people in your team should be completely different in the way of thinking. If you have a head of government, a head of state, who has advisors who have the same religion, the same color of skin, the same education, they come from the same university, why do you need them? They're just going to reinforce what you already know. You need to have advisors that have another religion. They come from another part of the world. They have another education. They, they believe completely differently than you. And they're going to challenge you. They're going to push you out of your, of your comfort zone. And they're going to avoid you mis making mistakes. And they're going to open you completely new fields. It's what happened in the Solar Impulse Project. It was so funny. I, I met in the beginning of, of the project an engineer, jet fighter pilot called André Borchberg. And he was completely different than me. And I told him, we should work together for this project because together we will make the one and one equal three relation. His experience, my experience, and both together building a third experience that would bring the solutions that none of us could find individually. And this is how we got creative. But I promise you, we challenge each other. We never agreed. We were laughing and say, I don't agree with you. Look at that. And by explaining why we were thinking differently, we managed to make each time a third solution that was so much better than what we did individually. And a leader should never believe that he is more clever than others. A leader should never believe that he is right in his decision. A leader should doubt. I'm sorry to say that, but I respect people who have doubts. I don't mean hesitation. People hesitating with everything. No, but doubts. If you have somebody who has certitudes, he knows where he wants to go, but he has no idea if it's good or not, and he has no idea if he will arrive to destination. Somebody who has some doubts, who is asking to others, what do you think? What are the forces in presence? What do we have to include in our discussion in order to decide correctly? This person you can trust. You can trust him because he will find a good way by being curious and open to all the possible directions. And he would drop the ballast to, to have the best altitude. Fantastic. Bertrand, thank you so much for these fantastic insights.